All right, welcome to chapter 22. Um, this chapter kind of opens up with this phrase right here. It says, endless forms most beautiful. Now, later on, when we talk about Darwin, we're going to talk about him uh, writing about the unity of life and the diversity of life. And this kind of reflects that right here. So we can see here that Lepidopterans, these are insects, which include the moths and the butterflies. They have many, many features in common, one of them being the juvenile feeding stage called the caterpillar. And then, of course, they have many, many features that are different, right? So many of their features allow them to be able to blend into their environment as an adult form. Even the juvenile form can allow them to blend into their environment. However, the difference between the two and between the different species uh, shows that uh, that diversity that he was speaking of. So there was a whole new era of biology that just kind of opened up once Darwin published his most famous works called The Origin of Species in about 1859. Now in The Origin of Species, Darwin described a number of things. One of those things, he noted that the current species or the ones that were living at present day at that time were descendants of the ancestral species. And he kind of looked at morphology and, and comparisons between those and, of course, the fossils that he studied as well. Now, he described evolution as descent with modification, right? So he used this phrase. He didn't really use the term evolution. Evol evolution, the term came much later. So the term evolution or the phrase that described it kind of evolved over time. You can describe it like that. Now, evolution can be viewed as both a pattern and a process. And we're going to go through this, this slides and it'll be pretty um, back. So we're going to do a little history, right? So uh, it, Darwin wasn't the only one who noticed differences in species or kind of was inquiring about it. The Greek philosopher Aristotle, he kind of view, had his own views of species. He viewed them as, as fixed and he arranged them on what's called the Scala Natra, right? So... Uh, he arranged them in order of more simple to more complex, but each species of fix basically doesn't change. So a whole new species arise, it just stays that way, and then new species arise and species go away. The Old Testament describes species as uh, things that were designed by God and therefore perfect for their purpose. Right? So they were made uh, perfect. And no species or no organism can be perfect. One of the more notable scientists, Carolus Linnaeus, uh, he was the one who developed that binomial nomenclature. Uh, he, he saw organisms or adaptations to organisms as uh, suggesting that there was a creator that uh, that each species was developed by for a particular purpose. Now, again, remember, he's the father of taxonomy. Remember, taxonomy is the area of biology that deals with classifying organisms. So classifying into their major groups and a lot their names are related to this as well. So he developed this binomial nomenclature that allowed uh, us to name species. Um, specifically, it's in a binomial nomen or format, so uh, there it includes the genus and the species epithet. Okay, so the genus is uh, how it's written or typed is the following. Okay, so here it shows uh, Homo sapiens typed. Now, Homo is the genus and sapiens is the species epithet, but together makes up the species name. Okay, so it's important to remember that. Now, uh, how they're typed is the following. So uh, if you're typing them, they must both be in italics and the genus must be capitalized. Now, if you're writing them, what you wanna do is write them with the genus capitalized and then the species is still lowercase. Lamarck was another noteworthy scientist. Uh, it's worth it to mention him because he uh, he came up with some interesting thoughts in terms of species and the changes in species, which unfortunately were not supported by a whole lot of evidence, but still interesting. He actually hypothesized that species evolve through the use and disuse of body parts. So that kind of suggests that, let's say, a particular body part, let's say your arm wasn't used, um, eventually it would be lost in that particular species if it wasn't used. 
Now this kind of leads into the vestigial uh, structures, which, you know, the, remember those are structures that had a function at one point, but over the course of time they were lost and no longer have a function, but still there might be some remnant of that structure. Now, yeah, I mean, I could see understanding uh, or leading to this hypothesis, but really there's no um, evidence that, that supports this other than the presence of uh, an occasional vestigial structure. Another thought that he, uh, he implied that there was an inheritance of acquired characteristics. Now, just that statement right there, so if you think about it, an acquired characteristic is a characteristic that was acquired later in life. So it was obtained. Something that's inherited was always there. It was passed on from the generation before. So inheritance of acquired characteristics, just that phrase doesn't even make sense. Now, uh, some other scientists related to paleontology and fossils, right? So the paleontology is the study of fossils. And we have uh, Cuvier, which is basically uh, the scientist that uh, speculated that the boundaries between the strata represent major catastrophic, catastrophic events in history. So a lot of these could be related to perhaps some of the mass extinctions that we've seen. Now, uh, th there's a couple of geologists of notes. Okay, so here we're dealing with the Earth's surface and remember plate tectonics. Uh, we have Hutton and Lyle. They per pre perceived that the Earth's surface changes uh, from slow changes in um, the plates, right? So slow continuous action. So it's not really a fast um, process that happened once. Uh, they note that, or they see these changes as always continually occurring, but at a very slow rate. Now, Darwin was influenced by uh, all of these scientists. More about paleontology. Remember, we talked a little bit about fossil and dating fossils. Remember, there's absolute and relative dating. Now, remember, relative dating deals with these layers in the sedimentary rock called strata. Now, um, fossils, what are fossils? Basically, they're remains or traces of organisms that were from the past. So they're dead now, and, and they were from the past. So um, the surface is a little bit more recent, but then as you go deeper in the strata, if you go down further, further closer to the Earth's um, core, let's look at a sample question, right? So here, uh, you find a section of sedimentary rock in which the strata and some fossils have been exposed. So you can see the layers and you see some fossils. You notice that there's a clam fossil and a fish fossil. The clam fossil is deeper than the fish fossil. Using relative dating, which fossil is most likely older? Okay. So if you chose A, clam, then you are correct. So basically, the um, clam was deeper in the strata so that it died sooner before the fish so that it's, it's actually older. So again, the clam is the correct answer. Now let's talk about Darwin since we brought him up. Now a little bit of history about Darwin. Uh, Darwin started out in med school and did, quickly didn't really make it through med school. After that, he went into theology and then graduated with a degree in theology. Now, um, after he graduated, he took a, a, a trip on the HMS Beagle, and this is where he learned about all of his stuff. This is where he found all of his recordings, his, his documentation of, of what he was seeing in this, this descent with modification. And here we're going to kind of talk about the descent with modification and his theory of, of how this happens, how things get selected for by natural selection, explains the adaptations in the organisms um, and also the unity of organisms in terms of commonality by descent. And then of course the diversity of organisms, meaning that they may be related, but they still uh, have some differences. So this is the voyage of the HMS Beagle. So here we're starting out in Great Britain. We moved around South America and then here. Right. This is the Galapagos Islands right here. Now, um, 
the trip went from the Galapagos Islands and then around, okay, you know, Earth is round. Hopefully you all know that. And um, imagine that this was a sphere and you're coming back around to Australia and uh, down at the Horn of Africa and then back to Great, Great Britain. But it's in the Galapagos where he found a lot of his interesting observations. <clears throat> now he collected a bunch of specimens, including he looked at fossils as well of uh, South American. So in the larger continent of South America of plants and animals. And he observed that fossils re resembling living species from the same region. And then living species resembled other species from nearby regions, right? So remember nearby regions, if we go back to the uh, map, uh, remember South America is a large continent which is very close to the Galapagos Islands, or the Galapagos Islands are very close to South America. Well, Darwin had quite an interest, interest in the geographical distribution of these species. And um, of course it was, it was uh, sparked by uh, what he saw in the Galapagos Islands. Um, what he did was hypothesize that species from South America had migrated and colonized the islands of the Galapagos and then speciated, meaning that over time, new species had arose. So then each of these islands, they're different environments, right? So when there's, there's a different environment, it causes adaptation and eventually speciation. So Darwin studied a lot of organisms, but he focused a lot of his writings on the finches of the Galapagos Islands. So in his, uh, he made a couple of observations, which we'll talk about, but in his reasoning for those observations, um, he uh, perceived basically adaptation to the environment and um, the origin of new species to closely related processes. So adaptation typically occurs first and then um, speciation uh, often occurs after that. Now, he studied these finches and he noticed that there were a higher percentage of cactus eaters in a island which had a lot of cactus and a, um, a higher percentage of the seed eaters on an island where the food source uh, was a lot of seeds. And another island had uh, really not much seeds or cactus, but uh, of course there were insects. So he noticed that there were a higher percentage of the insect eater type of finch. And the difference between these, of course, other than, um, you know, their colors, but if you look at their beaks, so um, adaptation to the environment, whatever food sources were in the environment, allowed the ones that could utilize those types of food sources to survive and, and be able to reproduce. So naturally, if that occurs, you would see a higher percentage of those types of finch in those particular environments. Over time, only the, the finch start to evolve and um, the cactus eater type finch, whatever species that is, starts to only interact with its own type and becomes um, divergent from the other types so they are no longer to, able to um, mate and uh, reproduce fertile offspring. So that uh, basically uh, results in, in the origin of a new species. Now, Darwin wrote an essay on about his his thoughts. Um, so it was mainly on natural selection. He saw natural selection as a mechanism of evolution, or what he called descent with modification. But he didn't really introduce it publicly. Most of the time, these things are, um, especially at that point in time, evolution, it was all, um, I guess, more religious in nature, so it might not have been accepted very well. Now, what is natural selection? It's a process in which individuals with favorable or inherited traits that are beneficial in that particular environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. So you would see an increase in that particular trait in that population.
1858, sorry, uh, Darwin received a manuscript from Wallace. And he developed the same kind of theory of natural selection, very similar to Darwin's. That prompted Darwin to quickly publish his Origin of Species so that he was the first one to publish on it. Shows a little timeline. You can see that it's not just Darwin and Wallace and then Lamarck. There are others. So uh, Hutton, he talked about the gradualism in terms of the changes in, in Earth and uh, related to the species, uh, the fossils. And then um, we have Math Malthus, which basically studied the uh, population changes. Um, so we see Lamarck. And then uh, Darwin, this is when Darwin was born, Cuvée. So a lot of these things were done before he was even born. And then here's the geologist right here. And then Darwin does his travels soon after the, uh, the geologist kind of published some works. And then um, he writes an essay. And then The Origin of Species is published very quickly after he gets that, um, that uh, publication or the, the manuscript written by Wallace. So in The Origin of Species, Darwin explained three broad observations. And I've already kind of mentioned these, right? So we've got the unity of life, the diversity of life, and the way organisms are suited to life in their environment so they can survive in their environments. Again, he never really wrote the word evolution, okay? Uh, it came later. Um, he used the phrase descent with modification, which is really what, uh, what kind of uh, summarized his perception of the unity of life. He, refer he refers to the view that all organisms are related through descent from an ancestor that lived in the recent past. Now, um, Darwin uh, kind of really started the development of these, this tree thinking, right? So he saw the history of life as like a tree with branches representing the diversity of life. So the branches show the, the differences, right? So the divergences and the tree where they're connecting is like their closest ancestors. So they came from others, right? So it was, it's almost like a pedigree that you probably learned about in general biology one. He reasoned that large morphological gaps, so morphological means like uh, appearance, so morphology and what or organism look like is related or between related groups could be explained by this, this branching process and past extinction events. So here we can see some groups that are relatively close together in history, but then we've got this other group that's further away. So there's some morphology gap right there in that space is. You could show that in a diagram showing the evolutionary relationships. Now, uh, let's talk about artificial selection and really compare it with natural selection and, of course, adaptation. So natural selection is, or uh, adaptation is related to the environment. Um, natural selection is kind of related to uh, adaptation and uh, kind of depends on uh, natural events that occur in the environment. Now, Darwin noted that, of course, humans purposely modify species by selecting by back then it was breeding right so it was breeding experiments they were selecting certain individuals with favorable traits or desired traits to produce an outcome in which they wanted so it was like purposefully selecting for certain traits this is called artificial selection okay so here's an example we have a wild mustard all of these vegetables that you might be familiar with in the grocery store all really have the same DNA as wild mustard. They come from wild mustard. It's just certain things are selected for. So here, if you can select for the genes, certain genes that, that make leaves, you get kale. If you select for axillary buds, you end up with Brussels sprouts. If you select for an apical tip bud, you end up with cabbage. And if you select for flowers and stems, you get broccoli. And if you select just for stems, you get kohlrabi, right? So 
all it, it all these traits are present in the DNA of the wild mustard. Just in wild mustard, they're not actually selected for. You can force the selection based on what you desire. That's artificial selection. Now, in terms of artificial selection, here's a sample question. Okay, so breeding uh, was very uh, important factor in the development of Darwin's ideas on natural selection. In which of the following respects is artificial different or distinct from natural selection? So thinking about natural selection, we've been talking about this all along, right? And artificial selection, which one do you think makes them too different? Okay, so we have A. It says artificial selection does not require heritable variation. B, artificial selection does not re result in evolutionary change. C, artificial selection does not rely exclusively on the environment to determine relative survival and reproduction rates. And D, artificial selection does not result in increase in favorable characteristics. All right, which one do you think it is? So if you pick C, you are correct. Let's go through the rest of them. So A, it says artificial selection does not require heritable variation. Well, I just showed you that, right? So in the, mild, in the wild mustard, the variation must still be present in the DNA. It's just actually not selected for, right? So it must be there, right? So A is false. Then B, artificial selection does not result in evolutionary change. Well, we saw the change in the wild mustard, so that's not true. And then D, artificial selection does not result in increase in favorable characteristics. Well, that's the whole point of artificial selection, is to select for the, the traits that you want that are favorable. Right? So um, D is not true. So C is the answer. So Darwin drew a couple inferences from two different observations. So let's kind of go through these. The observation that members of a population often vary in their inherited traits. So you can see here we have a population of lady beetles. So think about some things that you see that are that vary between them. What do you think varies between them? So try to think about it. I'm going to kind of name out some things as we go along, right? So how about the size of the spots that they have or the number of spots that they have? How about the color of their shell or their exoskeleton? Right? So the color can vary as well. Well, one inference that he made is the following. He inferred from this that individuals whose inherited traits give them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing in the environment that they are in. That's the key thing there. Remember, this is adaptation. This leads to adaptation. So natural selection and adaptation are very closely related. We've talked about this before. So those that have a higher probability of surviving and reproducing tend to leave more offspring than the others. So here, most of these lady beetles have spots. So those spots must provide some sort of benefit, right? So it must increase their probability of surviving and then of course, reproducing. Number two, all species can produce more offspring than the environment can support. And many of these offspring fail to survive and reproduce. Only some of them are selected for. This provides an unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce. Okay, so this is an unequal ability of, of individuals to survive and reproduce. This leads to the accumulation of favorable traits in the environment or in the population over time. Okay, so the ones that are more likely going to survive and reproduce must have the traits that allow them to survive and reproduce in that environment.
So, uh, kind of a, a review here. Darwin, again, was influenced by uh, a number of scientists. One of them was Malthus. Uh, remember, I kind of mentioned Malthus in the timeline when I w w was talking about that. And he studied populations or changes in populations. Darwin noted that the potential for human population to increase faster than food supplies and other resources is possible. Now, here are some things related to that, right? So individuals with advantageous traits will more likely produce more offspring. This will increase the frequency of those traits in the next generation. This also increases the frequency of individuals with favorable traits or adaptations in that environment. And this can explain how organisms become more suited for their environment. Now, some key features about natural selection as we summarize the chapter, or the, the first part of the chapter. If an environment changes over time, natural selection may result in adaptation. Adaptation must occur, um, adaptation to the new conditions must occur, and this could give rise to new species. So let's say the environment changes over time. So the environment changes, and it results in, let's say, different flowers or different shaped leaves. Now we have organisms that can blend in with their environment. So if this didn't happen, right, so if this it looks like a praying mantis, right, so if it doesn't uh, I guess adapt to its environment, it makes it more conspicuous so that it might be more susceptible to predators. Right, so this is natural selection. Selection for these adaptations would allow it to survive better in that particular environment. Now, here's a summary of the key features of natural selection. It's must be noted that individuals do not evolve. It's the population that evolves as a whole. Natural selection can only increase or decrease heritable traits. Now, adaptations vary with different environments. That's really the adaptation or the ability to adapt is dependent on the change in environment, right? So um, what uh, determines what traits will be selected for? It's the current environment. Now, uh, natural selection doesn't create new traits. It can edit or select for traits that are already present in the population. So the traits must be present. The DNA must be present for it to be acted upon. And evolution by natural selection can occur very rapidly in species with short generation times. Remember I talked about MRSA, right? So bacteria uh, can double, right? So they can have a generation time as little as 20 to 30 minutes, right? So evolution can happen or changes over the course of new generations can happen very quickly in those types of organisms. So segment two, we'll, uh, we'll be discussing what types of data that are used to document evolution. All right. Thank you for listening.